<laughs> okay, so um, hello and welcome. Uh, welcome, Sam. Hello. Um, how are you? Uh, yeah, very well. Um, like a little bit um, sleepy, um, just because. Um, so for those of you that don't know, like I've been working in um, an intensive psychiatric care unit recently in Carsview, which is, uh, it's not the same building, but it's in like the same campus as Nine Wells in Dundee. So it's just like their mental health unit. Um, so I'm still getting, because obviously, as you guys know, for the last like 10 months, I've just been a uni student bum. Um, so actually doing shifts in a hospital I've only done like eight, um, so I feel like a bit of a wuss, but like it's obviously, you know, it's obviously a bit of a shock to the system, but um, I'm definitely enjoying it. Um, but I think this, this, seeing everybody on the screen has definitely given me like an adrenaline rush that's woken me up. So I'm, I'm very excited to see everybody. So I'm doing very well. Good. So Sam, sorry, how long have you been in a new job for? Uh, only, I think it was May the 12th was my okay. start date so it's only been like a couple of weeks yeah um, and then what so obviously before then you were kind of well um well stuck into lockdown so how was that first kind of phase of lockdown um for you so it was actually <laughs> strangely quite nice like i think i think for everybody everybody has like a different interpretation on it because you know some of us are living with family some of us are on our own some of us have got uh, a garden some of us don't so it kind of varies for everybody but I think for Liv and I um, we tried to enjoy it as much as we could you know it was very rare that the two of us were at home together for such a long period of time you know whether it was me back and forth to uni or like when I was working at the gym and she was you know teaching at school so we just tried to treat it as like um, a holiday initially, um, which we sometimes felt a little bit guilty about because we knew the difficulty of the, of the situation. But I suppose we tried to turn it into something where we found new appreciation for just being at home and just enjoying the sort of simple pleasures of, um, of cooking dinner together and uh, watching films or TV shows together. Um, so we actually enjoyed it um, initially, I would say. I think we definitely had days like everybody must have done where you get cabin fever and you sort of miss going to restaurants or pubs or whatever. Um, but, um, you know, if, if I was to be totally honest, we definitely overall enjoyed that first phase of lockdown, just to be at home and just to have, have no, it, to be guilt-free in staying at home and, and not having any sort of you know schedule commitment was, was really nice yeah nice a uh, few beers a few beers i uh, uh, bet oh yeah definitely yeah, yeah. yeah good um, good the problem was like and again this is reverting back to the zoom quizzes like you would get to like a friday or a saturday and you'd have like three or four zoom quizzes that you're supposed to do because lives uh, friends from school and uni and stuff are like a separate group um, then I've got like a couple of sort of family and friend groups as well. And so you end up having to do like four different Zoom pub quizzes over the weekend. Um, and you don't want to let people down. So you end up doing all of them. Um, and everybody's expecting like it to be an event, you know, not just like sit there and, you know, be, be all kind of serious and boring. Like they're expecting it to be a genuine pub quiz. Like or organized fun. Yeah, 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 exactly. So... So there's been a few weekends when we've learned now to like not commit to all of the Zoom pub quizzes, but there's definitely been a few weekends where we've tried to fit them all in. Um, and it's been a struggle and we've maybe felt a little bit jaded the following day. <laughs> but we've learned to adjust and we've learned to just like pick and choose and, you know, say no to pub quizzes. Do all the Zoom pub quizzes that are on offer. Yeah, no, no that's good. Right, so Sam... Um, let's hit rewind um, and let's go back to what I'm presuming must have been about this time 2015 when the idea of opening a gym in St Andrews came around so um, 
where did it all begin? Like where where did the conversation start and how did how did that all kind of come around? So it was I think it was something I'd always kind of envisaged as like a pipe dream that I always talked about it becoming a reality, but I never thought it ever would. When I spoke to other people, I would sort of um, portray the image that I that I thought it would become a reality. You know, I'd say, "Oh, that would be incredible to open a to open a CrossFit gym in St Andrews would be superb. I think it would do really, really well." Um, and you know, we'd build you know a community, and it would be brilliant. And you know, I kind of portrayed as confidence that it would work, but you know, deep down. Um, I didn't ever think it would materialize. Um, so I was working in a CrossFit gym in Edinburgh um, and that started in June, 2014, um, which was great. Like it was such a good learning experience. And that was, that was the first time I, I ever got that sort of like autonomy of, of being, being able to run my own personal training business and coach classes. Um, and just learn what it was like to, you know, get up at, you know, five in the morning to, to open the gym and, and run a CrossFit class and then do a few personal training sessions, etc. So, and that was when I started, I think maybe six months into that, I started to, to develop that confidence that I could, I could open somewhere on my own. Um, but I never thought it would really happen because even though I knew I had the energy and the enthusiasm to do it, I had no idea logistically or like legislatively how you would rent a building, how you would um, buy equipment, all of those kinds of things. I had no idea about it. Um, and it was complete sort of potluck really that um, I ended up being put in contact with uh, Johnny and Graham um, it was just kind of like friends of friends of friends. And I guess the, the whole CrossFit community thing, you know, you know, affiliates, especially in Scotland, you know, all affiliates kind of know other affiliates uh, vaguely. And it just so happened that um, Johnny heard um, through his, through Naomi's mum, I won't bore with the sort of like, you know, the ins and outs that I, had always thought it would be a brilliant idea to open a gym in St. Andrews. Um, and so he just sent me an email and said, if we wanted to meet up and that was, that was really it from the start. And it, at the beginning, it just was me going to um, FFD and just training with them. And that was like, that would have been like August, 2015. Um, nothing was, was really being put on paper nothing was being, you know, set, nothing was set in stone it was just kind of building a relationship and building a trust, I think. So I went there, I think like once a week for about four weeks. Um, and then Johnny and Graham showed me the facility that we now know as the gym, as um, uh, FFSA. And then it was just, I mean, it was derelict. You know, there was literally like water dripping from the ceiling. Um, there was no flooring like we we know now there was nothing you know you couldn't really picture it as a gym it was just a huge empty derelict building like it looked like something dodgy from like a netflix crime series you know um and they asked me if i wanted to get on board and initially when i met them i thought i thought they wanted me to just kind of maybe coach there once they'd opened it and i thought it would be like a sort of distant thing in the future um but in the end, we ended up teaming up and sort of um, helping each other get the whole thing set up. So I stopped working at the CrossFit gym in Edinburgh. I was working at in October 2015. And then um, and then that's when I just committed myself full time from October 2015 to just building the gym from scratch. Um, and I didn't have a clue what I was doing. It was only once like once the you know once everything was in there like equipment and flooring and it was official that we were going to open that i felt confident in terms of getting people in and building those relationships and and running classes that's when i started to feel genuinely confident like i wasn't blagging it 
But prior to that, I felt like I was blagging it. Like I remember having a meeting and like, cause obviously Johnny and Graham at the time were still having to, cause FFD was, was still young then, you know, it was 2015. So I think FFD wasn't even two years old. So, you know, the, them along with, you know, the team there, like James and Liam and everybody else were still having to run that gym. And I remember getting a, a phone call. I, I was just, I was just going to the derelict building, what used to be the auction house in St. Andrews at like half eight every morning that I just turned that into my sort of eight thirty to six, whatever, uh, go there and paint walls or whatever, whatever I could do, just make it up as I go along. And I got a phone call off Graham saying, Oh, there's a woman coming from, uh, like the toilet company. And she's going to come and meet you. And like, she wants to sell like, you know, all the toilet products, you know, like toilet roll and soap and like all the stuff you put in the toilet. Like, you know, if you need a wee or a poo, you know, all the stuff you need for that. And I, I and that's all that kind of stuff that I was thinking, you know, shit, I hadn't thought about that. Like, obviously we're having a gym with people in it. We're going to need toilets um, with toilet roll. I, I, it's all that kind of stuff I didn't think of. So I had to actually go to the gym at like half nine, meet this woman who is like a full blown saleswoman trying to sell, trying to sell her product of toilet rolls and hand soap and all that kind of stuff. Um, I can't remember what the company was, but I didn't, I honestly didn't have a clue what I was doing. I just had to pretend like I had done this before. And like, it was like something off the apprentice. Like, I don't know if anybody here has watched the apprentice and when they, you know, have to try and get the best deal possible with whatever company. And I, I, I can't even remember what I said, but I don't think I did a very good job. Um, and I, I, I think we went with somebody else, but that was just like, I wish I could remember more details, but that's just an example of like blagging it. Like, you know, just standing there and she's in her like full suit, like trying to sell me hand soap and toilet roll and trying to get the best price. And I honestly didn't have a clue what I was doing. So it was only once the gym opened, once we got it to that stage, when um, I started to feel confident. Sam, what was your, so the dream was obviously St. Andrews, but what was the tie to St. Andrews? Like, obviously you're very Welsh, like you can't really hide the fact that you're Welsh. Um, so what was the draw to, to St. Andrews? So it was Liv really, so, so I met Liv, we both went to university down south in Bath, which is obviously like close to Wales. Um, and we met there and it just so happened that she was from Scotland originally. So once she graduated, she moved back to Scotland and I followed her. Um, and even though she's kind of been all over the place just with her, her parents kind of like moved to, to, to Dubai when she was younger, um, and she went to school, she went to like a boarding school up, up in Inverness. Um, they've always considered Crail in Fife to be their home um, since Liv was a teenager. So that's always where Liv's, Liv's always struggled to find sort of like a central kind of um, headquarters. Um, so she's always considered Crail in Fife to be her home. Um, and I bought into that right from the very moment I met her, you know, she sort of told me all about her home in Crail. And, um, I think I went there, I think we'd only been together maybe two months when I, when I came to Crail for the first time. So we got married in Kinkelbaya in St. Andrews. Um, and that was kind of when actually around the time of the wedding, when we were traveling over to St. Andrews a lot and getting to know the area a little bit more, that's when I started to realize um, that it was the kind of place I'd love to live. And at that point, I was already working at the CrossFit gym in Edinburgh. Um, and I, I think being in Edinburgh, I realized that it's such a dense city. And at the time, I think there's even more now, but at the time there were like five or six CrossFit gyms. And they were all so invisible. You know, the, the market was already becoming saturated and it, it wasn't even just like these independent gyms, these CrossFit gyms. You already had like uh, two David Lloyds, like four uh, Virgin Actives. And I just started to think 
the perfect place to open a CrossFit gym because it's all it is all about, and that's what I realised that the first place I worked, um, the cr- first CrossFit gym I worked, it is all about community. We always say that, and it sounds cheesy and it sounds stereotypical, but it really is. Um, but it was very hard to build that lasting community in in a CrossFit gym in Edinburgh because you've got another one two streets along, you've got another one, you know. Uh, five minute bus journey along you've got another one they're just they're just everywhere in very close proximity you know i'm not talking about like st andrews to kirkcaldy or st andrews to glenrothes i'm talking about literally like where the gym is now to where the vic is you know um and i just thought if you could have a gym like this but in a town that is small geographically um but it's big in terms of like its vibrancy of culture and people and, um, and it, and the university, obviously, like, I don't mean the university in terms of like, Oh yeah, we'll sell memberships to students. I mean like the university makes that town in terms of it, it just, it ups the population and it ups the, the diversity. So I just remember thinking being there, like if you open a gym here, there's nothing like it. There's literally, there's a leisure center and there's a university gym and that's it. Um, but I just, I had no idea how to get it started. So when, when, you know, when Johnny and Graham got in touch with me, I think they, they obviously thought it was a good business opportunity um, to expand kind of what they'd already started. And they just needed somebody who, it, for them, it wasn't a good business opportunity. It was a good life opportunity. Like for me, it wasn't, at the beginning, it wasn't about business. It wasn't about money or anything like that. It was about my lifestyle. You know, it was about like running, like somebody would want to run a small shop or a small, you know, salon or whatever. That was the same for me. Like I just had this vision of just being in the gym every day and meeting people and making friends and building those relationships. And um, so, yeah, that that's why I thought St. Andrews was kind of the perfect town because it's small but it's, it's very vibrant and it's very dense and it's very sort of full of life and full of people and full of, and it's very passionate as well, you know, so. Um, so talk us through um, day one. So gym up and ready. Uh, what was day one like? You've got, you spent a lot of time getting the place ready and then you open the doors and boom, how, how was it? What happened? What was it like? How did you feel? I was honestly for the first 12 months, I was pumped full of adrenaline. Like, um, every single day I, like, as soon as my alarm went off, I was, I was up and uh, up and ready. So day one was, was just like an exaggerated version of how I felt for the rest of the year. Um, day one was like an induction day. Like we used to do, you know, like, I, I don't know if like you guys have been to on ramps and stuff like that. It was, it was just like a huge on-ramp. But the difference being, we just had no idea who was going to walk through the door. Um, funnily enough, um, <laughs> funnily enough, Fraser Allen walked through the door on our on-ramp. So I think that's a pretty cool story. Like Fraser and his, and his dad, Adrian, were actually at our very first on-ramp as customers like who I didn't know the names. I didn't know that. Yeah, you're right, mate. <laughs> um, and he was only like a little, you know, innocent teenager, you know, not like the, the big chunky adult that he is now. <laughs> um, so we didn't know what to expect, you know, and I, I was just, it was the, the most, ex- at the time it was the most exciting thing I'd ever done in my life. It was just, it was just bonkers. You know, there were times when you, like I sort of felt like I had to pinch myself, you know, where you'd set this place up and you'd spent day in, day out for two months, just going in and painting walls and painting doors and getting equipment delivered and having meetings with uh, toilet equipment saleswomen and not really knowing if it was going to materialize, you know, because all this kind of stuff was happening for two months without a single customer, you know, without any, any interaction with, whether we were going to have a member or not, you were putting stuff out on Facebook and you were getting likes on Facebook, but we could have that first day of that on ramp, we could have been standing there in our FFSA t-shirts that Russell made. Um, and nobody like nobody would have turned up. 
Um, but thankfully, I think about 30, 30 odd people turned up. Um, and I, on that day, it was life changing for me, definitely, because I think I was feeling for the last sort of two years, I was feeling a slightly unfulfilled in my previous personal training job and my, um, and my coaching job, just because I really wanted more. You know, I loved, I, I loved the fact that I had started personal training and started CrossFit coaching, but I really, I was so ready to take it further and to meet more people and to make it a little bit bigger. So when all those people walked into the door, it was just like, I, it sounds like a massive cliche and like an over-exaggeration, but for the first six months in particular, I felt the best analogy, an analogy I can give <laughs> is like, it's how I'd imagine One Direction felt. <laughs> like when they became famous, yeah? So they're like, you know, they're, they're thinking, oh, we've made a boy band. We don't know if it's going to work. And then all of a sudden it sort of like skyrockets. I mean, I'm not comparing us to One Direction, but I just mean like on a smaller scale. <laughs> That's a comparison that I can support. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, all of a sudden, like every day, it's just like you're doing like shows every day and you're meeting fans every day. And it, it was like a, you know, like a, a small, a very scaled down version of that. So the excitement and the adrenaline for me was just constant, you know, constant. That's cool. So then over the first like kind of couple of years, so like early 2016 through 2017, um, how did the place like grow? And then like, what were your, what were your expectations? Like as time went on, like where, where did you kind of see it going? So I think, I think that's probably, I, I never saw it going any further than, than it did in those first two years. Um, and I think that's, that's where, and I'm sure we'll get onto that, but that's where I realized that sort of business wise, my ambitions weren't actually that big. Um, I, within the first two years, all of a sudden we built so many relationships, just even, even like standing in front of a full class of 15 people, um, in 2017, um, I still would have moments where I'd think I can't believe this is happening. You know, I never stood there and thought, right, this, this is great, but we, we got to make it bigger. It's got to be better. It's got to be bigger. I, I still had those moments where I was standing in front of a class of 15 and I thought, uh, shit, like, I can't believe I'm, I'm here. I can't believe there's all these people that are actually wanting to come and give us money to stand here and listen to me, you know, talk shite about kettlebells and barbells. Like, I still couldn't believe that was happening. So I never, I never really fully got over that novelty. Um, so like you say 2017 i just hoped that it would stay the same <laughs> um and be preserved i think i think you know um i didn't want people to lose interest you know when there were classes of 15 people and everybody's excited and i think one of the coolest things for me was seeing people like members that i'd never met before and then was slowly starting to get to know um becoming friends with each other. You know, you, we've seen people become genuinely very, very close friends um, because they met in class, you know, and that's happened quite a lot. And that, it was those kinds of things that for me were really all I'd ever dreamed of. You know, I'd never, um, so I think for me, it was all to do with relationships and to do, um, and to do with, with seeing people get excited. Um, really, and never went beyond that. And that was very apparent in, um, in sort of 2016, 2017. And I just really wanted that to be preserved. That was all I saw, really, you know. So I'm going to skip to this question, Sam, because this question's uh, kind of relevant. So um, Carrie's asking, do you set, to set up a CrossFit, CrossFit gym, um, do you think you would have benefited from a business qualification or... Um, was the passion and the sport skills that, that you had more important um, in terms of opening the gym? So obviously you did do a sport, you did do a sports related yeah. degree. So, um, so no, yeah. I, I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't do a sports related degree. Um, oh, you did social science, didn't you? Social science. Yeah. 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 Um, hmm. 
You know what? Like, um, crikey. I don't know if a business qualification would have been relevant because I don't know what it feels like to have one. Um, if I was to, because it, it'd be quite bold of me to answer this question because I'd be guessing. But if I was to guess, I would say no. Because if you had a business degree and you did really well in it, but you didn't have the emotional connection with, with your business idea or with the people, um, then it's just not going to work. It's always going to fizzle out because I think building friendships, it's, I'm always going to sound cheesy, especially because I'm drinking a beer, but like um, building those relationships and building those friendships um, and letting your passion for whatever the product is or whatever the service is, is always going to, is always going to trump any, um, any, you know, sort of, sort of textbook knowledge that you've um, acquired from a degree, really. If you've got the two together, then that, you know, that's a winning combination, like absolutely. Um, but first and foremost, it needs to be just a raw, I would, I would say a raw emotional passion for not just the service and the product, but for the people as well. And for genuinely wanting to build meaningful relationships and connections with people. Um, and if you've got the foundation, just that kind of like foundational knowledge of just the ins and outs of business um, and management, then that's even better if you've got the two together. Um, but I'd say the most important thing is, is the relationships and the emotional connection with the product and with the people, definitely. Nice, Carrie. I hope that hope that was a good answer. Um, right, so Sam, you obviously spoke that um, kind of opening the gym was a was a bit of a life changing moment um, for you. And then a couple of years later, you obviously had another like fairly major life changing yeah. moment when obviously Liv Liv got ill. Yeah. Um, so just talk us through that and and how that changed like your, essentially your, your life and how that changed your outlook um, on kind of everything. So, um, it's a t it, when, I look, when I look back on it, I, I always look back to the moment that we kind of officially found out that she was unwell. Um, because everything after that then was, we tried our best to amalgamate that into our everyday lives. But obviously, the moment that we found out, it was very, very separate from normality, you know. So after that, I think we, it didn't always work, but we tried to sort of weave it into everyday life. Um, but the moment that, it, that we found out was genuinely very unexpected. I hope people don't mind me running them through it. I, I won't make it too, like, graphic or anything like that, but... Basically, um, she'd been feeling unwell for a long time. Um, she'd always had kind of like issues with her tummy since, since we'd met. Um, and by this point, we're talking five years. We'd been together for five years. And she'd always had kind of just like a little bit of a funny tummy, like sensitive with different foods and stuff like that. And, but it just started to, to, the symptoms just started to get a little bit more severe. And so she'd been booked in for a colonoscopy, you know, where you get a camera up your, your bottom um, with, by her GP. It was recommended by her GP. And by the time the date for the colonoscopy came round, which was December 2017, um, she'd actually started to feel a little bit better just with like different kind of medication we tried, just like over the counter medication, you know, for your tummy. Um, so we went in for the colonoscopy, like not really expecting anything. Like we thought maybe we were genuinely totally under the impression that um, she was just sensitive to different kinds of foods and she just needed to, to regularly take sort of tummy medication. Um, and then she, it was in, it's a private hospital in Dundee and she went in for the procedure and she was back with me in the waiting room within like five minutes. 
which is way quicker than they told us. You know, they'd said it would be 20 minutes. Um, so we sat in the waiting room afterwards and she was kind of saying, oh, that was, that was way easier than I thought it was going to be. And she was like really relieved, you know, because she's, she's quite a private person. She wasn't really keen on, on all that kind of stuff. Um, so we were sitting in the waiting room watching um, Place in the Sun on the TV, uh, which is like a really shitty Channel 4 program where uh, I believe British people decide it would be better to live in the desert like an hour and a half away from Lisbon um, in a, like a, a house that looks like a public toilet that costs 20,000 euros. So we were laughing about that um, and just getting impatient because actually the fact that we were in Dundee was a bit of a treat because we thought maybe we'd go and get a McDonald's before we went home. Um, and then the nurse came in and she just l suddenly looked sheepish. And before the procedure, she, she was very, very smiley and friendly and bubbly. And she just suddenly, it was very strange to see a professional woman, um, you know, in her forties looking nervous and quiet. And she was obviously sitting waiting for the surgeon to come in and, and speak to us. And so the surgeon that did the procedure came in, um, and told us exactly what it was um and it just it didn't it didn't feel like a real life moment it was it was very very strange and i know that sounds kind of a bit cliche um but it certainly it certainly felt like all of a sudden things you'd seen in films you were it was like you were on a movie set you know it was, it was very very strange um so you know, you do all the usual things then, you, you, you try and stay calm um, and you go, as, as uh, me anyway, um, you know, I went and spoke to my, my parents, obviously, and, um, and then after that, it's just a whirlwind. You just have to try and do the best you can whilst also looking after yourself, you know. And we'll get on to all that kind of stuff, I'd imagine, in, in a bit throughout this chat, because when sort of life throws difficult things at you, you can only, you're not, it's not always going to be perfect. You know, you'll try the best you can, but you're going to get exhausted. Sometimes you're going to get angry. Sometimes you're going to get sad sometimes. And so it was very much like that for the next sort of few months, you know, where you're just trying to, um, you're not making it up as you go along, but you're certainly trying to, to keep up appearances, but kind of hold yourself together a little bit, you know. Um, that's the best way I can describe it. Sam, how did you balance, um, like, caring for Liv and, like, work? Because, obviously, like, what we do, like, one-to-ones, like, pretty intense, like, mm. like on the, we're all obviously on the receiving end of, of like, a lot of, of um emotional stuff from clients and and you hear probably more from your clients than than you care to imagine so like how how was balancing like what you were going through and work like how did how did you cope with that so i'd say actually i'd, I'd love to it sounds weird to say love but like i just feel even even if they're moments that were really hard i, I think they can be really powerful especially if you tell them to other people but the first person i told after my pet literally the morning so the the evening i just described with the colonoscopy um and when we found out this life-altering news that was and, and the, even though it was you know when you see in the films when people find out that their partner or themselves are very ill um you you think it's going to be sort of like a um it's going to be an incredibly traumatic m moment there and then but actually, the, when we got home, the adrenaline was so, like, through the roof and the disbelief was through the roof that we weren't sort of, like, sat in bed crying that night. You're just kind of, like, the adrenaline's up there. So you're just, we were just kind of saying to each other, oh, right, okay, God, this is fucking mental. Like, we'll just, what are we going to say? And actually, the next morning, I, I was in the gym at, at, um, for 6 a.m. class um literally immediately after that night and you fraser were in for a pt i think like 
half an hour later. Like I think you had like, a, I think I was in for 6 a.m. class and you were in for a 6.30 PT. And it was one of those things where I was like, I was like, I didn't, because you're my, you know, colleague and one of my best friends, I didn't want to tell you there and then because you were working and I know how, how the job really, like being a personal trainer relies on being an entertainer and being like positive and stuff. And I was like, I really don't want to tell him, but um, as a colleague, um, but as, as a close friend, I was like, I feel like I've got no choice right now in this moment because I need to leave. Um, so I had to tell you just straight, straight up. I remember it so vividly. I just managed to get you to one side in the doorway in between the CrossFit room and the open gym. And I just said it as it was like no tears or anything. I just said it as it was. And I felt awful doing that to you because it put you in a, a terrible position, like a really awkward position. But I just felt it was important to just tell it, like get it done and then leave. Um, what, what was your initial question? <laughs> um how it was um balancing yeah, right sorry sorry so actually then once i started peting again it was i'm very lucky in this instance and i imagine other people who are personal trainers or in other similar professions uh where they're working one-to-one -one, like hairdressers or uh gps or nurses or whatever you know they have to work closely one-to-one -one with people aren't in as lucky a position as i was but i had a really, really wonderful group uh, client base. Um, like sort of my, my collection of clients, I had my caseload. When they found out, whether it was from me or just from friends of friends, um, they were just really supportive. And actually the personal training sessions ended up being um, very therapeutic for me. Um, and just because I built up a friendship with all of my, with all of my clients at the time, and they were all really fun people to be around. And some of them were, you know, eccentric and entertaining and, um, a, like a pleasure to just be with and to help. Um, and that made all the difference. And I was very lucky in that sense. And I, I genuinely felt that at the time. I'm not just saying this cause I'm on camera, but like, um, I had all of my clients. I felt like I was very lucky that they were paying me money to let me do something with them that gave me some relief in that moment, you know, to have their company, to have their chat that just like gave me some comfort um, and just like giving them workouts and, and telling them to do kettlebell swings or telling them to do burpees was um like therapeutic for me you know it was it was just like that bit of relief that just kind of brought me back down to earth and brought me back in the room and brought me out of my own head and my own mindset you know so i obviously had to do less because i couldn't do you know, like 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 you guys know like fraser and kirsty and fraser know um sometimes you can do like 10 hours 11 hours of coaching in a day sometimes um, obviously I couldn't do that because, you know, I had to go to the hospital, um, and I was sleeping at the hospital at the time. Um, but that like, I, I tend to have like maybe four clients sort of in the morning, um, throughout that period. And it was actually, it gave me real confidence and that human connection and that friendship and the kindness my clients showed to me, you know, they, even though they were paying me, they still seemed to prioritize my feelings and my emotions um and that yeah that gave me a lot of strength to be honest i think but i i'm not saying that's the same for everybody you know i i think i genuinely think i was very lucky in that sense with the with the clients that i had i think it's important to say that liv um is obviously fine um she's yeah, made she's a fine. tremendous yeah. recovery yeah yeah, yeah. Um, how is, so how is she yeah yeah she's fine she's doing a zoom thing with her school friends and yeah. I think she's drinking gin, so I think she's fine. <laughs> yeah, she's 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 doing she's doing pretty well. Yeah. Um, so obviously, after like the after Liv came through her treatment and was kind of on the road to recovery and such, like, um, that was kind of the stage where you 
started to look away from the gym and you were thinking about mm. a career change. So what was the, what was the kind of um, thought process behind the career change? Like why, why at that stage was it that you were looking to move from fitness into what it is that you do now? So I've been actually looking forward to sort of talking about this um, because I think, I think a lot of people maybe i might be wrong but i think a lot of people are you know especially members may think um you know it would be a crazy decision to kind of leave leave that day-to-day routine behind um because i loved coaching classes and i loved personal training and i I loved my colleagues you know and i still do (laughs) i didn't i didn't didn't used to love them (laughs) but you know we were still all really good friends and um I was very lucky with that sort of environment, but I think f- what a lot of people forget maybe or, or don't know is that opening the gym in St. Andrews, that wasn't day one for me. Um, day one was actually scrubbing treadmills in David Lloyd's in Edinburgh till 11 o'clock at night um, back in 2012. Um, that's when it started really working in the fitness industry. And, and and the motivation was very strong from that moment onwards, you know. So I left, I, I got a good degree from a, a really good university in nothing to do with sports um, in social sciences. But as soon as I finished my degree, um, I said to my parents, like, I really want to give personal training a go. And and they supported me straight away, like no questions. Um, because I think they knew, they knew it, that sport and coaching, it was always a huge passion for me. Um, like ever since I was like, you know, like, it, like literally as soon as I could run. Um, so it was always something, I think it was always there. It was always something I needed to do, not to get out of my system, but just to see how it went, you know. Um, and it went further than I ever imagined it would have done. Um, when I was at, uni- I think my final year at university, I think, I don't know if other people that have been to university have experienced this, you know, you sort of like, especially when you're 22, you develop this like resentment of your degree because you're just like a bit fed up of it and you're fed up of doing essays and you're like, oh, this is shit, man. Like, I just want to be like in a gym, you know, like personal training. That'd be the dream. So I was kind of feeling like that. Um, and I'm glad I was because um, I was able to give it a go. You know, I didn't, I didn't just keep it as a pipe dream. I sort of, as soon as I graduated, I just went straight into do my personal training, um, you know, qualification. It was like a six week intensive course in, in David Lloyd's in Edinburgh is where they ran it from. Um, and once it got to, once I started getting close to 30, when I'd been working in the fitness industry in whatever capacity for seven years, I just felt like I got everything out of it that I wanted to. Um, and it was like, it was a really hard decision because I didn't want to leave all the people behind and the fun of just coaching a class and being in front of a room of people. But I think where I realized I'm able to stop doing this day to day work wise, you know, I knew I wasn't good. I knew I kind of told myself I wasn't going to give the relationships up. So that sort of, I let that sink in. I was like, you know, just because you're going to stop working at this place, you know, it doesn't mean that it's not still, your hub it's not still your place you're going to where all your friends are and and, you know where you're going to be able to go and and train and etc um but i realized that i was starting to sell people short so i was starting to care less about the sort of intricate details of crossfit of like i loved it i love coming up with workouts you know, that look cool on the board and like doing them with my friends and stuff. But I was starting to care less and less and less about how heavy I could squat or how good I could squat or 
what how, how how my snatch looked or like all the technical stuff i was starting to really not give a shit about anymore it was just i was just starting to run out of steam with it which is not it's not right necessarily like so i don't want people to think that still having an int- interest in that is silly because it's not it's actually superb but it just i couldn't avoid it i wanted to maintain my interest in it but it was it was leaving me um of, of those technical details and i thought this isn't fair on my on my clients and on the people in my classes you know i'm gonna give them my heart and soul in terms of my relationship i'm always gonna give my heart and soul in terms of making them feel better about themselves and like motivating them and just making them laugh and um and inspiring them to exercise and get sweaty but i'm if they come to me and say i really want to get better at pull-ups i want to get better at gymnastics i want to get better at um, at, at my Olympic lifting, I want to get a stronger squat. I, I'm not going to be able to give them that the, my integrity with, with those kind of technicalities. And I thought that's not fair, really. Um, and I thought, like, I'm always going to be able to give them the relationship stuff, you know. Obviously, like, my degree, like, because uh, I've been doing my master's degree, I, and we'll get into that. Like, I've not been as present in the gym as I would have liked the last year but i know i will be again soon um so i'll always be able to give people like maintain those relationships and those friendships and stuff but i'm not going to be able to give them the level of coaching they deserve and i and actually like you guys like fraser and kirstie and fraser you know your level of coaching and your passion for not just the people but the craft itself was just starting to grow and grow and grow and grow and it was the craft, your passion for the craft that was starting to, to overlap mine. And that was just when it, it, it's like an intrinsic sort of feeling in you, a voice in you that was telling me like, that's it, you need to just pass the baton on. Um, and I was starting to care more about, um, well, I guess we can get into that, but I guess just just uh, just being a human being and how complicated it can be to be a human being. I'm starting to care about that kind of stuff a little bit more um, than the actual craft of of helping people get properly fitter. Um, and I knew that our clients were starting to really want that, you know, like the members really want and they love the hobby and the sport of, of CrossFit. They've chosen it as their hobby. Um, and it was just the same as anything else. Like if I was going to be a rugby coach or a badminton coach or a hockey coach or anything. And I, yeah, I love coaching them because I, I love making them laugh and entertaining them, but I, I'm, I'm not really going to help them get better at their craft. You know, that's not really fair. And that's when I started to realize that I needed to move, move away from it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's absolutely fair. And um, so obviously you moved on from the gym and you went into your masters. So what was your master's in? Like what's the exact title of your masters? So it's a masters in counseling studies. Okay. Um, and finished? Nearly. So I finished everything except for, I need to hand my dissertation in. Okay. Um, so I've literally finished every part of the course except for just handing in my dissertation or thesis whatever you want to call it um but i i've i think actually thanks to lockdown like i had a lot of time to to do to do a huge amount of that so that gets handed in the due date for that's not till august um so you know i've got plenty of time and that would be you know that would be no issue um there were obviously parts of the course that were like a little bit more stressful with deadlines and stuff but i've managed to get to a stage now where I pretty much feel like I've, I've finished it. I just need to, to smooth out the edges, you know, and hand in my dissertation. And you're obviously, so you've got this job in Nine Wells, but what's, what's the plan long-term in terms of um, what you want to do with your master's? So I've been working as a healthcare support worker in an intensive psychiatric uh, care unit. So just like, just like in in a hospital for like injuries or severe physical illness you'll have 
an intensive care unit um, or maybe for people that have just come out of surgery it's the same in a in a in a in a psychiatric hospital um, or in a mental health unit um, there'll always be a ward where people just just need um, sort of round the clock care and they need to be there needs to be more staff and less patients so we can really really look after them um, and my sort of initial thought was I knew after my counselling masters I wanted to become a counsellor um, but I wanted to have some time working in a clinical setting and working with the NHS and in a hospital because I thought there was so much to learn off the nurses and also in a psychiatric ward um, there are people there that are that have have a wide variety of acute mental illnesses so obviously with counseling and it will get onto this um because there's a lot of stigma with it it's not you don't have to be you don't have to have a diagnosed mental illness but in hospital it's people it's people that have um have a diagnosed mental illness, whether it's um, personality disorder or psychosis or schizophrenia, et cetera. So I, I wanted to work with people who are going through these kind of, kinds of illnesses. Um, so I can, I can learn more about, about humans really, and, and just learn how to, how to be there for people with, with mental illness and, and be in that setting where sometimes you can be put under a lot of pressure um, and you're not only, you're not only accountable to your patients, but you're accountable to your colleagues as well. And you have to help them. So I kind of thought I'd be in that, in this job for a little bit longer because I've only just finished my master's. So I thought I'd be um, in the hospital for maybe a year or so. Um, and to just kind of build up that, that resilience and, and build, you know, really widen my experience. Um, but I've been offered a counselling role at um, a college in Cooper, um, which starts in August. So I'll actually be only be at the hospital for another uh, six weeks or so, um, and then I'll start start my new role in 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 Cooper. And I also hope to to continue seeing people at home. Um, I've sort of while I've been studying, I've had a few people to the house, not not many, but just um, just sort of every now and then I'll see see a client at the house. Um, but I hope to continue that on top of um, counselling students at the college at Cooper. Um, and it, I guess it's this that's where there are similarities, you know, with personal training is just building those genuine relationships with your clients or building those genuine relationships with um with the people you see on a one-to-one -one basis um just without without the without the um without the fitness without the kettlebells um and in a, in, a, in, a, in obviously like a slightly more sort of confidential and private setting so i feel i feel like personal training personal training and counseling have not it's not like a completely separate thing i feel like the last few years of personal training have definitely uh, been a stepping stepping stone towards what what i'm about to do next so mental health is obviously a, a massive thing um just now so what um like what are things that you come across commonly or like what advice do you have to people that are like maybe struggling or um, just kind of dive into some of the knowledge that you've picked up like over the last year while doing your masters so I think I think the big thing for me is um, there's been about self perception um, if I was to try and like simplify it all because obviously it's it's all very very complex you know it's all about how we see ourselves um, not so much how we treat each other I think a lot of the rhetoric that we see on Instagram and on social media it's all about like be kind to each other. Um, it's okay not to be okay. Hashtag hashtag hashtag. Um, but it's it, which is really great. It's great to see the the you know like such a huge population of people start to try and talk about it and try and show support. But you know, really, it's not about necessarily always about us being kind to other people. 
it's about how we can learn and this sounds so cheesy but it's true mm -hmm. it's about how we can learn to be kinder to ourselves so it's all about self-perception really um and we we've all been put unwillingly you know we were born without being asked to be born into um very strong cultural demands you know whether that be from our families or our you know generations before us like the media etc and it's very very difficult for all of us to live up to these cultural demands you know i've had a few people who have been in touch with me saying that they might want to come and see me but they don't think they should because they don't have a mental illness and they're already that's they're already showing like they're denying themselves that um they're denying themselves something that we all really have the right to have which is to just be able to talk openly without fear of scrutiny or um or being struck down by a lightning bolt um because as humans you don't have to have a mental illness as diagnosed by a gp we all feel things and think things that contradict the culture that we've been put into you know um, and by culture i don't mean like your religion or your country it doesn't have to be as big as that it can just be your family or the town you live in and we all have these thoughts that contradict those things you know um and i think especially in the uk like we we really beat ourselves up for having those thoughts um or you know if, like if i can just give an example like i think a lot of us feel like we have to be busy we have to be seen to be working really hard all the time we have to be seen to be pursuing a career or trying to be successful and if we are not really in the mood to do that we don't want to um we beat ourselves up for it and we suppress it you know we hide it and i think it's about giving people that opportunity to just have a space where they're not going to get slagged off by anybody by their friends or their family or they're not going to make their family upset they can say whatever it is that's that's on their mind even if it's like they are terrified to say it because it totally contradicts how they've been brought up or or their sort of like cultural stipulations they can just say it and they're not going to get judged for it they're not going to get told off for it um because it's natural to feel all of those things you know um and i think that's 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 really the biggest thing for me and that's the biggest motivation it's just that i've definitely sort of like in the past i beat myself up for even when i was younger for thinking things that contradicted like what my friends thought or how they acted or um and i sort of like would think god i'm so such a weirdo for for doing this or feeling like this or thinking this um and it's it's, it's trying to make it more acceptable that we are literally animals that have been given this huge brain um that is very very complex and to not have a space where we can express all of those crazy things that go on in this huge unnaturally big brain that we've all been given as as monkeys to not have that space where we can just say whatever it is that's going on in our brain um is not helpful at all you know it can it can make you feel very 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 sad and very very confused and very very anxious so um that's definitely the biggest motivation for me. That's what I've realised. Um, Sam, can I talk about your own mental health? Hundred percent. Yeah, of course. So how how's your own mental health helped you in like what you're looking to do now? So obviously, you've had a lot of uh, trouble in the past with your own mental health. So how has that um, helped? And has that been a struggle with you, like while you've been learning about it, or is it helpful, or I would say I would say 100% helpful. Um, yeah, 100% helpful. It's just like learning that we all build up these conditions of worth. You know, we all build up these conditions in our head of 
okay, if I'm to be like a worthy person, a worthy human being who's, who has the right to, to exist and to be appreciated by other people or to be like, um, to be sort of like, to have plaudits from other people, to have like status, uh, there are these conditions I need to meet. I think we all, we, we all have those. Um, and I had those in spades, you know, from a really young age. And in learning that those conditions are just, they're not real, you know, they're not you. They don't define who you are. They're just built up from things you see on the TV or experiences you have every now and then, or just conversations you hear in passing from friends or family or whatever it is. And you build up these conditions of like, of who you're supposed to be and who you're supposed to appear to be. Um, and I definitely had always done that my whole life without really realizing it. I think all of, you know, I think all of us do. Um, I, don't, I don't think I've, I've not, I've definitely not met anyone who's just gone their whole life with thinking, nah, fuck it. I don't care. Like I'm just going to behave however I want. Um, and in throughout, throughout the last couple of years in learning about why, um, why I, I had been beating myself up so much um, at times, why I had been feeling so disappointed in myself or anxious about who I was. Um, none of it was really real. You know, it was all these like conditions and tick boxes that I had developed for myself that had accumulated over a very, very long period of time. And it was about like identifying all those tick boxes and kind of trying to dissolve them a little bit. You can't like eradicate them because that's not realistic. You know, they're always going to be there. You just have to recognize what they are and just try and not take them so seriously, you know, be like, oh, okay. For example, like, for example, like a condition I may have held is like, ah, oh, I have to be like really funny all the time. If I'm to be like a worthwhile bloke, who's like you know deserves recognition and deserves to be you know deserves to exist i need to be really funny all the time you know i need to make people laugh all the time um and every time like i might say something in a group of people um that just didn't go down well i might go home and beat myself up about it later and and i hadn't recognized that for a long time and once i'd recognized that as a condition that I held, I was able to be like, Oh God, like, well, that's, that's, you know, that's a little bit silly. Like I'm not going to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to deny, deny it. I'm not going to try and pretend it doesn't exist. I'm just going to recognize that I have that condition and try not to be so harsh on myself, you know, for having it, you know, um, it's very, very, you know, it's all very, very hard things to do, but I think it's recognizing what, what kind of stipulations you put on yourself, um, and trying to not feel like you, you, you should have to meet them all the time, you know, um, just trying recently, I've sort of been telling myself like, and others that you, we're all, we're all just trying to do our best, you know, and, uh, you know, life, especially, you know, in Western culture, with especially with social media you know telling us we have to be hard working we have to be seen to be you know really cool or entertaining or um entrepreneurial um you know it's a lot of pressure so i think sometimes just telling yourself that hey like it's very complicated all the expectations you're doing the best you can like try and give yourself a break every now and then you know um you don't you don't always have to be to be so brilliant or you don't have to always be so productive or you don't always have to be so um so energetic you know just try and give yourself a break i guess it's that kind of rhetoric i've trying to be i've tried to buy into what you have um so i remember when we worked together that was always a constant a constant thing that you would say to us as be here Fraser, like you need to take a break. Like mm. you're going to, like you're going too hard, you're going too fast. Um, so like you've clearly had that in there subconsciously for, for like a a good amount of time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. yeah, definitely. 
I used to actually, I think my, 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 I can see my dad there with his little glasses on screen. And he'd probably agree when I was little, <laughs> when I was, when I was young, when I was a teenager, like I was awful. And my parents used to call me Ernie, which means like as in Ernie Ernest, because like in the less serious moments, if I had a game of rugby and it could literally be like an under 12s game of rugby, which like was not a big deal at all. If I missed like one conversion kick, I would like, I'd literally think it was the end of the world. I'd be like, well, that's it. Oh, I'm terrible. I'm awful. I'm an awful rugby player. And my parents would try and help me like lighten the situation up a bit. Um, but for some reason, I haven't quite figured it out yet. For some reason, I had it in my head that like, um, that was a that was a harsh condition I had to live up to, and it wasn't you know it definitely wasn't my parents that were were putting that on me. They were doing the opposite. You know they were trying to tell me that it wasn't a big deal at all. Um, you know just trying to enjoy it. It was probably what it was probably watching like watching sport on TV. You know watching people like watching sportsmen on the TV be brilliant, and you feel like you have to live up to them. Um, so yeah. It's it's yes, yeah, it's, it's tough, and I think I think we I think we all I've definitely seen it in the gym. I hope people don't don't mind me saying that, and I totally get it because I remember when I first started CrossFit, I I had it as well, where you just compare yourself to to other people all the time, you know, you forget to commend yourself on how far you've come, and you just always compare yourself to the people that are better than you, you know. And you forget to compare. This sounds weird, but you forget to. It's okay to do this. Don't feel guilty about doing this. You forget to compare yourself to the people that are shitter than you. <laughs> like that's okay to do when you're at home in private. Is to be like, don't always be like, oh, I, I didn't. You know, I, I tried to clean seventy kilos today and I missed it. That's rubbish. And look at him off YouTube. Like he's cleaning a hundred kilos. He's busy. Like, why not say to yourself, hang on. I, I nearly cleaned 70 kilos. Like, you know, 75% of the population can't do that. You know, it's okay sometimes to compare yourself to people that can't do the things that you can do currently. You know, I think, and I've definitely, I definitely saw that a lot in the gym um, when I was working there. Um, it's people being, being so, so harsh on themselves, you know. And sometimes I, I would admire that. I would admire that sort of level of, um, of like self-reflection and, and determination, you know, to want to be better, to want to be better. Like I really admired that, but I think it could, it could, it could sometimes just, I could see people become exhausted, you know, emotionally exhausted because they're just beating themselves up, you know, treating themselves like a punch bag. Um, and I guess like I've realized recently it, that it really is okay to, not okay, actually, it's, it's, it's imperative to, compare yourself to a population of people that can't do the things you can, you know? Yeah. Um, so we're just going to touch on this because it is relevant. I, I've been trying to stay away from the current COVID situation, but uh, people's mental health in lockdown, um, what would you be saying to people that, that are struggling um, just now, given that, they can't do a lot of the things that, that they can normally. This is a good question, actually. I'm glad you've asked this, bro. Um, don't, again, don't slag yourself off for being a lazy bastard because it's inevitable. We, we're in lockdown. We can't do anything. We can't go anywhere. Don't wake up and think you have to be, like, really productive all the time every day. You know, don't beat yourself up. For, for being lazy like it's just it's just inevitable and um try to rather than like maybe when we weren't in lockdown you're you judge yourself on how many things you'd achieved that day i would say in lockdown try not to do that at all just judge yourself on how you felt that day how you've enjoyed that day like how good that day has made you feel about, about yourself. And, and that's it, you know, try, try and simplify that as much as possible. Like 
because I think I've, I've definitely heard from a lot of people that have said like, oh, I'm so useless because today I woke up and I watched Netflix and I didn't do anything else, you know. And, and but, but some, you know, sometimes that's just how you feel, you know, you just sometimes feel a little bit exhausted. And I would say um, if you've done one thing that day that's made you feel accomplished and it's sort of made you feel like, um you've done something challenging then that's fine you don't need to have like eight hours worth or even five hours worth doing that if you've literally like if you've literally gone out for a run and that's all you've done that day or you've just done one thing productive in the house even if it's only taken half an hour um then fair play like don't beat yourself up for the fact that you haven't that you haven't you know saved saved the world or solve the world's problems in, in that day. It's interesting that you said that, Sam, because that's um, pretty much exactly what I've done during this is each day I'll wake up and I'll be, I'll look at, at the things I want to do. And I just say to myself, right, one thing, here's what I'm going to do. And at least then if I, when I do it, like I've got that little bit of accomplishment and, and normally that leads me into doing like more with my day because I feel accomplished. Yeah. And so it's interesting that you said that. Yeah. I mean, like, for example, like I set myself the task yesterday of watching four episodes of Peaky Blinders and I actually watched five. And I mean, like that, that I, I thought that was, a, that was a massive, that was a massive achievement. I gave myself a pat on the back for that. And uh, what's that, the seventh time you've watched all of the Peaky Winders episodes? Yeah, correct. Correct. Nice. Nice. <laughs> um, so um, let's come off mental health uh, and let's get back onto you. So obviously there's some exciting times ahead and your life is about to change um, again massively. Um, you and Liv have a little one on the way. Um, now, obviously, because of Liv's um, cancer treatment, it's via a very different set of circumstances. Um, so how are you looking forward to little one coming? How are you set up? Um, when's the little one due? Um, talk us through how that's going to be, uh, how that's going to change your life. Um, uh, like, like uh, insanely excited. Like, if there's one thing I've always been uh, very sort of sure about since I was... Um, probably since I was like a teenager is that I've always wanted to be a dad. Um, so I'm very, very excited about it. Um, I can't believe it's only one month away. That's still quite surreal to think that in, you know, because like if I think about one month ago, that that's gone like that. And to think in the same amount of time in the future that there'll be a baby is, is bizarre. Like that's, um, that's crazy. Um, but I, you know, I absolutely can't wait and um it's all we've been very very lucky it's all considering considering the sort of the procedures um it's all gone really really smoothly of course like with covid we, we are you know we're sort of worried about the the freedom in terms of like our family being being able to see us and see her so obviously my parents are in brussels um and we're tr hoping that they'll be able to come over um we, we we think they will but obviously there's some complications attached to that so that's that's obviously making us feel anxious and making us feel nervous but um but ultimately yeah we just i mean i just i just can't wait to be honest like i just to be honest like like i just can't wait to have somebody to actually play games with because Liv's really mature and she's like a grown up and she likes to, you know, do adult things. Like I just want somebody to like, you know, once she gets a little bit older, just like, you know, go outside and play in the garden with and like maybe we'll get a climbing frame and I can I can go down the slide and go on the swings and stuff like that. Yeah, good. Um how are Martin and Caroline feeling about um being granny and um granny and grandpa? Uh, not happy at all, to be honest. Like I was meant to have an arranged. It's custom in Wales to have an arranged marriage, um, so they've never really agreed with the whole thing. You know, I was meant to be married to a girl called Shan Llewellyn from our, <laughs> our, our small village uh, just outside Swansea, 
Um, and that was always planned from a young age. And I defied our culture um, and married, you know, a girl from a different tribe, Celtic tribe in Scotland. And so they, they're still not really happy about it, to be honest. You know, they're, they're still quite disappointed. Um, is it <laughs> is it Granny and Papa or is it... Um... <laughs> Have, um, they what, have they decided what um, they're going to be? We were trying to like, so like I say, I say like Welsh, like I keep going on about Wales, but like obviously like um, I've grown up in Belgium really um, for most of my life. So my parents still live there. So initially my mom, um, who is sitting just to the left of my dad, I believe, um, she kept trying to come up with like, uh, there they are, they're in bed. Um, she She kept trying to come up with like, really pretentious like french sounding belgian granny names because obviously they've lived in belgium for the last like 30 years um but we couldn't really agree on any so i think i think it's just going to be granny and grandpa <laughs> nice nice <laughs> but well well we say grand dad wants grandpa but i think like my mother my dad's called martin um so they were thinking maybe grandpa mart which might turn into like grumpy mart <laughs> <laughs> what kind of thumbs up? And what, Sam, what do you call it? What did you call your grandparents? Oh, just like I've got, I was, I was, I was similar to you, Fraz. I was lucky enough to have all four for quite a long time until recently. So I had Nana, Nana and Gramps, and I had Grampy and Gran. Nothing exciting. Grampy, Grampy Martin. Uh, yeah, I could. Uh... Yeah, Grampy, yeah, Grampy, Grandpa. We could come up with a Welsh one, maybe, but I did, we can't. None of us can speak Welsh. I don't think we really have the right to come up with a Welsh one. <laughs> yeah, okay. And um, what about names? I am genuinely quite happy to like just tell everybody what her name is because the reason is because we've already bought a lot of baby paraphernalia with her name on it. Ah, okay. So it's kind of too late, you know. Um. So her name is Monica. Um, and that is, I know like a, a lot of our close friends and family know uh, that we are obsessed with the TV show Friends. <laughs> so it's in reference to that because I've always thought, I've always thought Liv is very similar to Monica from Friends. It was actually my suggestion. Like I claimed that from like a few months ago. I said, why not? Why not call the baby Monica? So we're going, we're going with Monica. We've actually not had a good reception on it. Like a lot of our friends and family have been like, oh, Monica. Yeah. But, um, but, you know, no, we're going, we're going with Monica. <laughs> um, middle names? Um, yeah, so, yeah, so two, two middle names, which I know is normally quite, that's normally for the uh, socially elite, but... Um, hey, less of that. I have two yeah. middle names. <laughs> Yeah, well, you 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 own a farm, so yeah. <laughs> so um, we're going with um, Patricia, which is like a family name on Liv's mum's side that's been kind of passed down, um, and also Eleanor, which is the name of our surrogate. Nice, that's a nice touch as well. That's that's cool. That's cool. Um, right, okay, Sam. Um, we're going to wrap up the the hard stuff there. Um, for those of you who have uh, seen these or heard these, um, I always finish with a quick fire round. Um, so Sam, basically the only rules are um, you have, some of them are either yes or no, and the other ones you can have a couple of sentences to answer. Okay. Um, are you ready? Yeah. Um, nice simple one to start. Um, we know you're a beer man, uh, so what's your favourite beer? <laughs> My dad knows this, and my mum. Uh, Orval. So this, this is a, it's a very unusual Belgian beer. It, it originates from like the 13th century, I believe, and it's still made by monks in a little abbey in Belgium somewhere. So, Orval. Um, if ever you go on a night out with Sam, um, take a swift um, turn past Aikman's. Uh, that is yeah. where he will make you drink things you have never drunk before. Yeah. Yeah, Aikman sell all those beers, and there's you're guaranteed to have like a a, a bunch of seventy five year old men playing uh, American country rock music. It's very strange. And if you drink the strong Belgian beer whilst watching them, it becomes this cool sort of trippy experience. 
Uh, so that's a night out with Sam for you. Uh, cheers <laughs> to be a part of that um, at your peril. Um, okay, uh, big Everton fan. Yeah. Uh, Favourite Everton player? Easy. Duncan Ferguson. Why? Uh, because he's mental. <laughs> like, because he's so... And actually, like, if you've ever watched an interview with Duncan Ferguson, like, he's so bizarre and eccentric. Um, it just makes me love him even more. And actually, Callum Robert, so I can see sat just to the right of Kirsty, he bought me a Duncan Ferguson jersey for my leaving do from the gym. Um, and it's still my favourite, like, relic that I have in the house. I wear it all the time. And all my family and my wife, like, hate it because I look... It, the collar's quite tight and it gives me a double chin. So... But I don't care. I still wear it. Nice. Um, best ever Everton manager? David Moyes. Well, whoa, okay. Since I've been alive, David Moyes. Before that, Howard Kendall. <laughs> okay, fair. Okay. Uh, this is going to be a tricky one for you, and I'm looking forward to the answer. Okay. Uh, Wales are in the World Cup final. Uh, 79 minutes, 50 seconds on the clock. They've got a penalty to win yeah. the game. You've got Lee Halfpenny in his prime and Neil Jenkins in his prime, who takes the kick. Neil Jenkins, every time. Really? Yeah, it doesn't miss. It just doesn't miss. He's literally like the rain man of goal kicking. I'm a little bit shocked. <laughs> um, is it because of the sand? No, like if you just watch, if you watch enough like old footage from the 90s, you'll just, you'll be amazed at his consistency. He just doesn't miss. He's Lee Halfpenny's kicking coach. Yeah. He is the master. He is like Mr. Miyagi of goal kicking. Um, in your opinion, Wales's greatest ever rugby player? Fuck. Okay, so I know everybody says Gareth Edwards because obviously it's supposed to be Gareth Edwards. But if I was going to go with the one that's like in my heart that just inspired me the most, and I think in the professional era it was Wales's greatest ever rugby player, Shane Williams. Nice. So, so not Gavin Henson? He, he could have been, Gav. He definitely could have been. Um, but he was just too orange, wasn't he? So, that, so that's my next one. Uh, who, has, who had better fake tan, Gavin Henson or James Hook? Uh, me. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't used it in a while because the sun's been out, but I know how to use Dove Tinted Moisturiser. Moisturiser. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, Kirsty knows. Kirsty, Kirsty, Kirsty taught me. Um, yeah, I know how to use it. I know I used to use the, like, the strong stuff, but I was too pale for that, so it got patchy. Um, but, okay, if, if it wasn't me, then definitely Gavin Henson. Nice, nice. Um, next one, what's the worst CrossFit workout you've ever done? Oh, right, okay. That's a really good one. I'm going to have to go with Fuck. Okay. This might surprise people because there are other ones, you know, with more complex movements. Um, but I would say, is it 16? No, 17. Was it 17.5 with the double unders and the thrusters? Yeah. Yeah, that I think for me that was the worst. And there's a really bad. <laughs> if you uh, uh, Kirsty has a photo, I think she might have posted it on the on like the Facebook page before. A really bad photo of me doing that workout. Um, that was the worst workout I've ever done. I think because we did it all side by side. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did in 2017. I think just because like it was so repetitive. You know, it was the same thing. And the rounds seem to just churn out really, really quickly. You know, so like when you do a 10 round workout, it's fine if like there's a bit of variation and a bit of leeway or a bit of respite, but it just seemed to be endless. You know, it seemed to be like a 100 meter sprint for the whole time. Um, and I felt very ill. Um, and yeah, I thought maybe I'd need a defibrillator or something. So yeah, that, that would have to be it. Did you feel ill the next day or was it ill during it? 
Kieran. Kieran. I was going to say, purely that might be because of the beers that we had after we did it. Yeah, no. Nah, nah, nah. I don't get hangovers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, you've gone, uh, you've been dropped on a desert island. Um, you've got one item of food. Is it a ball of mozzarella or a pack of parma ham? Ball of mozzarella. <laughs> Why? It's just so lovely and like creamy and like chewy and yeah, it's the best. Sam, elaborate why I've just asked that question. What was your staple diet when you worked in the gym? Um, mo- ball of mozzarella eaten by hand like an apple uh, and a packet of parma ham. <laughs> that was my lunch. That was literally all I ate. If it were, I was in there for 12 hours, that'd be all I ate. <laughs> you dead, right? right, Sam, I'm going across the road to m and uh, What can I get you? Just, just the usual. Yeah, ball of mozzarella, ball of mozzarella, ball of mozzarella and parma ham. And if you're hardcore, you just drink the juice from the mozzarella packet. Ugh. Ugh. That's horrible. I, I never did that. That was a rumor. That was like a rumor that got passed around. I think Graham, Graham started that rumor. It's not true. It's not true. <laughs> it's so horrible. Okay, last one. A uh, little, um, a little bit more serious. Um, What's the thing in your life that you are most proud of? Uh, I'm glad you asked me this question because I've always wanted to answer it. Um, 100% uh, my marriage, 100%. We we met when we were 21, 22. Um, and we've been through a lot together, uh, not just with Liv's illness, but just, uh, you know, everything. So, And we've made a lot of friends together. And so, yeah, 100% my marriage. 100%. That's cool, bud. That's cool. Okay. Um, that's them all. Okay. Um, before I shut the recording off, Sam, is there anything that you shamelessly want to plug while you're here? One last thing. I didn't get to say, but the gym would not be what it was without Fraser Clark, Fraser Allen, Kirsty Roberts, and then all the members. Um, I'm so proud of what you guys have all done together. And I never imagined it would be the wonderful, wonderful collaboration that it is and i'm so so proud of you all and i can't wait to see you all you're all my my best friends and and well done everybody thanks bud appreciate that thanks very much okay uh thanks for uh tuning in i'm gonna start recording thank you bye mate bye love you